make no uh, mistakes about it. I understand I'm not worthy to hold his Bible for him as he preaches. And you stand behind this pulpit, you take upon yourself a great responsibility because of the truth and the gospel that that's came from this pulpit. So for me, it is an absolute tremendous honor. Open your Bible this morning to the book of Micah. You don't hear much from the book of Micah. It's, uh, it's the seventh book. The last book in your Old Testament is Malachi. So if you go to the last book of your Old Testament, count back seven books, uh, you'll come across the book of Micah. Uh, we're going to go to Micah. We're going to read just a few verses there. And then we're going to read a few, just a few verses out of Colossians chapter number 2. But Micah chapter number 7, and I want to call your attention to verse 18, 19, and 20. The Bible says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. Colossians chapter number 2 and just verse number 13 and 14. Your Bible says this, And you, being dead in sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you. I've been having a little trouble with my glasses lately. Some of you all know that. And I came in here one time and forgot them. So you watch, follow me real close in case I miss something here, okay? Let's look at that again. And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven some of your trespasses. I missed that. Boy, I did, didn't I? Yeah. Thank you for catching that. Having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it, to his cross. My Father, as I bow in your presence, Lord, I've spent time in preparation and in prayer and seeking your face, seeking your will. But my Father, this is as far as I can go. Unless you anoint me, uh, there'll be no preaching done. I can give a few points and a close and just bore people to tears. But my prayer to thee is that you would hide me behind the cross. If you would uplift the only one that means anything. Uplift the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep me out of the way. And in this I'll be pleased and happy. I ask it in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. You may be seated. I, this, uh, it's amazing how the Lord gives me messages sometimes. I, I told, I think it was Sister Vivian that was sharing something with me that the Lord showed her. And it uh, was very hard yesterday, not, not to steal what Vivian uh, showed me, uh, but I used to keep a pad by my bed because uh, so many times uh, I'll wake up in the middle of the night with a thought. And when I was younger, I, I would say to myself, I don't need to write that down. I'll remember that in the morning. Uh, you know, and, but the older you get, no, you write it down. And uh, this, this, this message the Lord laid on my heart, it came from a picture uh, that Brother Roger sent me, had, he had no idea, uh, bad memories for me and him. Uh, we, we worked up in Cosby, Tennessee, uh, redoing a, a cabin. They called it a cabin, it was a house. And uh, I mean, it was rough business, man. I mean, just old, hard, rough work. And we stayed in one cabin while we worked on the other, stayed up there all week long. And it brought back bad memories because he's a perfectionist. And I would be holding a tube of tin, uh, giving it all I had on, on, on a stepladder, and I'd say, Sprig that board, Roger. You're killing me. Put a nail in that thing. Uh, we're a 30 second off, Mac. And I said, You're going to be a 30 second off in a minute if you don't put a nail in that thing. And uh, he liked to kill me up there. 
and uh, because he's, he's just so particular. He'd say, my name's on this. And he said, I noticed the plumbing part. You turn all of the red writing at Charlotte Pipe sticking straight out. Why do you do that? I said, my name's on it, but it don't take me 20 minutes to glue a joint. <laughs> and so if people was around us and heard us up there, they think, well, man, these two's about to get ready to get in a fight. They're getting ready to kill each other. And, uh, but I love him. He, he's more like a brother, but he is a perfectionist. And so I asked him, preacher, I said, hey, why don't we change places? Uh, let me, let me uh, run that nail gun, put a nail in it. But see, he knows how to manipulate me. He said, Mac, I would do that. He said, but you got them big arms. And he said, you got all that upper body strength that I don't have. I said, well, I, I, I feel you. Go ahead and put a nail in that thing. But there was a little pond up there uh, that belonged in this, where they had these cabins. And it become a joke to us because we had to walk past that little pond, spring-fed pond, going from one little cabin over to work on the other one, and you could see the bottom of it. You could see the bottom of this little old pond. But there was a sign posted there that said, private pond, no swimming. <laughs> really? You know, you could see the bottom of it. And this one, no fishing. Wow. <laughs> There'd be no need to do any fishing. There's nothing in there but tadpoles. But we, that was a joke to us every morning, carrying our coffee, walking from one to the other. I'd say, Roger, no fishing. Yeah, I know. No swimming, Mac. Okay. And it become, and he sent me that, and the Lord started working on my heart with that, with that thinking about that posted sign. And I want to talk to you this morning about no fishing. No fishing. Micah, his name means who is like Jehovah. And uh, an important thing about Micah, he was actually a contemporary of Isaiah because he ministered during the same time that Isaiah did. Ahaz, Hezekiah, Jotham. And if you look at Isaiah 1.1, Isaiah was ministering at the same time Micah was. But the only time we ever hear anything from Micah is during Christmas time because chapter 5 and verse 2 prophesied the place of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you read through the book of Micah, there's seven chapters in the book of Micah. And it, at chapter 7 deals with the condition of the Jews during the tribulation period. And he says some very important things in there. And keep in mind, he prophesied this 700 years before the birth of Christ. My, isn't that amazing? And he made some prophecies concerning Israel and the Jew during a time of tribulation. In verse number 19, he prophesied that the Lord would turn again back to Israel. And that's exactly what he will do. He turned to the Gentiles because he came into his own. His own received him not. And so the nation of Israel has been temporarily spiritually blinded. But in the tribulation period, just like Micah prophesied, he will turn back to the nation of Israel again. He said in verse number 14 of chapter 7, the Lord will bring them into the wilderness of Petra and there he'll feed them. Well, I wonder what he'll feed them while they're in the wilderness. Well, in Exodus chapter 16, he fed them manna. He'll take care of his people. He will appear to them, Zechariah 12, 10, and he'll show himself to Israel sometime toward the end of the tribulation period. The Bible said they'll look upon him whom they pierced and they'll mourn for him. It's one that mourns for his only son. Nation will be born in a day. Man, what a thing. He prophesies all of that. Isn't that something? You don't hear much about Micah, but he prophesies about the tribulation period and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he made this statement talking about the sins of Israel. And understand, there, there is a doctrinal application of Micah chapter 7, which has to do with Israel. But there's also a spiritual, historical and spiritual application. And he said, talking about them, he said, the time will come when God is going to take your sins and he's going to cast them into the sea. He said it like this in other places. In Psalms 103 that we read in Sunday school, he said, I'm going to remove them as far as the east is from the west. That's infinity. That's a distance that no man can measure. Isaiah, his counterpart, 
chapter 38 and verse 17 said he's going to take your sins. He's going to put them behind his back. Man, isn't that something? Now, so the, the common denominator between Micah chapter 7 when he's talking about what's going to happen to the sins of Israel in the tribulation period, the counterpart to that is what we read in Colossians chapter 2. The common denominator is sin. What's he going to do with it? Well, when it comes to the nation of Israel, he's going to hide their transgressions in the sea. He's going to put their transgressions behind his back. That means he can't see it. You say, how can he do that? There'll be a fountain open. Well, I could jump a rabbit. I can't stay. I got to stay with my message. In Zechariah 13 in that day, the Bible said there'll be a fountain open for sin and uncleanness in Israel. The common denominator is what he does with sin. We come to Colossians chapter 2. That has to do with us. That has to do with the body of Christ. He told the Jews, I'm going to put your sins in the depths of the sea. And then we come to the counterpart that applies to us. And notice what he says. He said that our transgressions have been forgiven. See that? Not only have they been forgiven, but he said, I've blotted them out. <laughs> if you ever blotted something out, if you blot something out, you can't even see it anymore. He said, I blotted it out. And notice he said, I took it out of the way. In other words, I took your sins... In the age of grace, when you came to me for salvation and I put them out of the way, I blotted them out. I nailed your sins to my cross, never to be remembered again. Common denominator. What does he do with sin? I know what he done with mine. <laughs> do you know what he done with yours? Yeah, he blotted mine out. Hey man, he hid mine. He doesn't look upon them anymore. Now, I, th it brings me to this. If you want an interesting study to do in the Bible, do a study on Christ and fish or fishing. It is a tremendous study, especially for us men. But it is a, it is a tremendous study in the Bible because you find a correlation in the Bible between the Lord Jesus Christ and fish. He told Israel, I'm going to put your sins in the depths of the sea. Well, fish live in the water. And you'll notice if you look at it, number one, Jesus liked fish. Amen. Amen. It said, and we, and we sung about it, come and dine. He walked out on the shore and he said, children, have you any meat? They said, no, we've toiled all night long. And they came to shore and he had bread and fish upon the fire. Wow. I, I, I thought about this. Brother Tim Green came. To, you remember that, brother? Years ago. Came to temple to preach uh, out of Lansing, Michigan. And the church was so excited. It's hard to get excited about anybody coming to preach when you've got Charles Lawson. <laughs> But we got excited about it, and especially the ladies. Oh, I, you should have heard them. Oh, he is just, he's one of the most handsome preachers. Yeah, and I listened to him. And psh, God, I mean, look, look what you already got. <laughs> but they would do that. Oh, he is just so, oh, oh, he's just, oh, he's gotten, oh, but he is so good looking. So Brother Tim Green come here. With all them female hearts are fluttering. And guess what he preached? Why men like to hunt and fish. <laughs> Woo! You talking about something that backfired on them. That had to be one of the most anointed messages I believe I've ever heard. Why men like to hunt and fish. Number one, and this is not from Brother Green's message. Jesus ate fish. In Luke chapter number 24. The Bible said after his resurrection, he ate a piece of broiled fish. See the correlation between the Lord Jesus and fish. Not only that, but he talked to fish. Boy, that'd be a good fishing partner, wouldn't it, Brother Golden? He talked to fish. He told one in the book of Jonah, I've got a backslidden preacher. I prepared a huge fish, now go swallow him up. And then in chapter 2, 
of Jonah and verse 10, you know what your Bible said? Your Bible says this, and he spake to the fish and said, vomit him back out on the shore. So we're talking about a, 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 a savior that likes fish, that ate fish, that talks to fish. Wow. Not only that, and I love this one, he commanded a preacher to take up the fish. I used to use that on Shannon, Matthew chapter number 17. He said to go down to the sea, cast a hook, and take up the fish. And she'd say, what are you doing Saturday? I said, I'm going to follow the commandment of Matthew chapter 17. I'm going to cast in a hook, and I'm going to take out a fish. And he told Peter to take out the fish and to open its mouth, to be able to open its mouth, Brother Sean, and to get money out of it, it had to be a, a large mouth, wouldn't you think so? So he told a preacher to cast in a hook, to catch fish, and open its mouth, and you'll find a piece of money there that will pay you taxes. I used that on Shannon. Where are you going this time? I said, tax season's coming up. Yeah, she knows more about fishing, fishing than most preacher's wives. So he commanded him to take up the fish. Not only that, but he knew where they were. He knew where they were. Another time, he, the, the disciples said, and understand, these disciples, they made their living by catching fish. These were not rookies. This was their livelihood. And he said, they said, we've told all night long. We had not caught a thing. And the Lord said, uh, cast your nets on the other side. And I'm sure the disciples had to think, I love him. Don't get me wrong. He's my Lord and master. I love him. But does he not think we know what we're doing? You know, this is what we do for a living. Nevertheless, Lord, it's your word. We'll do your bidding. I don't think they had a whole lot of faith in that. But the Bible said, by his bidding, they cast their nets on the other side. And they brought in a load of fish. They had to struggle to get back to the bank. My goodness, man, he knew where they were. He encouraged fishing. <laughs> now, some of you women is looking at me like, boy, this service is over, pal. You better run for your car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, know, I know you want the yard mowed and the house painted, but we, we, a lot of times we're just following what the Lord gave us directions to do. And uh, he, he encouraged fishing. His first two disciples were fishermen. And he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Amen. Amen. But having said all of that about the Lord and fish and fishing, there's a time when he says, no fishing. No fishing. What do you mean, preacher? I mean, let me, let, and most of you already know what I'm about to say. The greatest ammunition the devil has against you is your past. Yeah. That is some of his greatest ammunition. And we met here yesterday, and I, I want to say that, I, and, and everybody here will agree. I, I, I know our pastor is, is feeling weak this morning, but just his presence in this building <laughs> does something to this congregation, doesn't it? I mean, yesterday we met, we had a meeting, and we fellowship, but most of us had a heavy heart. You know why we had a heavy heart? Because I told those that was here when I got a phone call from Preacher Lawson, his heart was heavy because he couldn't be here. And I shared that. So even though we had a good productive meeting, we done it with heavy hearts because his presence wasn't here. Amen. Just his presence being in God's house at Temple Baptist Church just seems like, it, you know, it's kind of like, it. well, daddy's home. We're good. Amen. Now, he will use your past against you. And so there was people yesterday that volunteered to do this, volunteered to do that, stepped out and said, I'll do this. I'll pray about a burden for that. The first thing that's going to happen to you, if it hadn't already, the devil's going to step in and said, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're going to stand up and do something for the Lord, are you? <laughs> 
Yeah, you remember being a happy head back in the 70s? Well, boy, you drunk more whiskey and smoked more dope than you could put in this building. <laughs> but you're going to be a help, right? <laughs> you're going to stand up and help somebody out. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> and he'll take you fishing and he'll pull up sins you committed 30 and 40 years ago. And he'll beat you down to where you don't feel worthy to do anything. Well, as Brother Anthony, that Brother Tony said and said, we're not worthy. You know the best thing you can do? When the devil comes to you and he brings up something, man, that you've done 2015, yeah, last week, that you ask the Lord to forgive you of. And when he forgives you, if you believe this Bible, he blotted it out. That cleansing flow, man, it happened at Calvary. And if you walk in the spirit, as Preacher Lawson's been teaching out of 1 John 3, man, it's a continual cleansing if you're walking in the spirit of the Lord Jesus. So you know in your head you've been forgiven of it, but the devil will bring it right back up. And he'll say, you're not worthy. Well, the best thing you can do is agree with him. That's what I do. Boy, you're right, man, you're right. You're absolutely, I am so unworthy. Man, I remember all that garbage I'd done. I remember getting my head kicked in in bars and stuff and having my head busted open with a dog chain. You're right, Satan. You're absolutely right. I'm not worthy. Woo! But I'm accepted in the beloved. When he sees me, he doesn't see those sins. They're hid behind his back. He sees his son. Next question. You start wearing him out like that, and after a while... Uh, he'll start backing off just a little bit. But he'll come to you and he'll try to take you fishing. And you need to understand that our sins have been forgiven. That's what your Bible said. Amen. That our sins have been put behind his back. That's what your Bible just said. Not only that, but our sins have been nailed to his cross and been cast into the sea. You ever wonder where some of these songs come from? Uh, I think it's page 138. You ask me why I'm happy. I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. Amen. They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary as far as moved as darkness is from dawn and the sea of God's forgetfulness. That's good enough for me. Amen. Praise God my sins are gone. Amen. I guarantee you already, uh, the Lord gave me this message, man, and he's made it so powerful in my soul. These people sitting here right now and you come in here beat down and, and drug out and wore out because the devil is wearing you out with past sins. That's how he works. He works on preachers probably over time. Past sins. Let, 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 let me say this. You step out to do something like some folks did yesterday, the next call you're going to get, the devil's going to say, hey, hey, that's pretty good. Hey, let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. I have pastored drunkards, Drug addicts, prostitutes, and gang members. I pastored one man who had been stabbed 11 times and left in the middle of the highway for dead. But God. <laughs> and I'd watch them grow. One lady comes to my heart. Oh, God love her heart. She knew what she had been. She had a hard time getting past what she had been. And I tell her all the time, sissy, look, you're a new creature. All of that garbage, it's gone. It's gone. The Lord doesn't even remember it anymore. Amen. I said, it's the devil that's bringing that back to your mind. You're letting the devil take you fishing and pulling up sins that you've already got forgiveness for. And I, she got to where she, she got brave enough that she'd get in the choir and sing. Nobody knew but me and her. No. Nobody knew her past but me and her. And the Lord. And I watched her start to grow. And, and start to bud. And start to smile. And I remember one Sunday she was in the choir singing and her little hand went up. I thought, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Maybe it's starting to settle in on her mind that those sins are gone. They've been covered. They've been blotted out. But there'll always be somebody, even somebody from your past. They'll never forget. See, the difference between us and the Lord Jesus Christ 
You may punch me in the nose, and I have been punched in the nose <laughs> in a church parking lot, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> you may punch me in the nose, and I can, I, you know, I can forgive you. And if I'm right with the Lord, I have to. I have to forgive you. But I don't have that ability to forget. You understand what I'm saying? I can forgive you, but I don't have that faculty in my brain to forget it. That means that every time I see you, even though I've forgiven you, I think, yeah, that fellow busted me in the nose. The difference between us and the Lord, you go to him and you pull your soul out. And you tell him, he already knows what you are. He already knew what I was. And you pour your heart and soul out to the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the sweetest words you'll ever hear come to your heart is forgiven. Amen. Forgiven. Amen. Wow. Man, that's why it feels like a thousand pounds has been lifted off of you. Man, I mean, for the you realize forgive. I've been forgiven. When he forgives, he forgets. Somebody wrote a song a long time ago. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. That's the way he is. And I'd see her start to flourish, man. And the Lord start to use her. And then, I mean, when the Holy Spirit of God gets on one person, you know what it does? It's like an electrical current. <coughs> this one here feels it. <coughs> and before long, she had that whole choir shouting, praising God. And then I missed her a Sunday. I missed her on a Sunday night. She wasn't there on Wednesday night. I missed her the next Sunday. And then the next Sunday night, and I called. I said, what's going on, sis? Nothing. I said, something's going on. She said, well, I've been reminded of my past a couple of weeks ago. I said, okay. Okay, let, let me help you out here. I said, you're breaking one of God's laws. And that's what I told her. She said, what do you mean, preacher? I said, you're trespassing on private property. He took your sins and put them in his private pond. And it's posted. Stay off the grass. <laughs> it's posted. No trespassing. No fishing. <laughs> These fish are contaminated. They've been covered with blood. No fishing. I said, listen, you've been breaking, you're breaking the Lord's heart because you're going back and fishing out of his private pond that he has posted. She said, I never thought about that. And I said, yes, ma'am. I said, well, I'll see you Sunday. She said, I'll see you Sunday. And she was there Sunday in the choir singing, had her little hands up. And after she walked by, I said, don't go fishing anymore. <laughs> How many knows what I'm talking about? Amen. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Man, right when you think you're getting some victory and man, God's using you, the devil sat down and said, hey, fat boy, <laughs> you remember... Yeah, because I don't have the ability to forget it. And the devil knows that. And boy, before long, he's got me uh, with juniper treeitis. Oh, my goodness. I can't, Lord, I can't go. I can't stand up in front of them people. I'm not worthy. No, that's, that's the thing. Uh, like Brother Tony taught in Sunday school. That's why God uses him, because he knows he ain't worthy. God will not use a preacher that thinks he's worthy. No, he'll withdraw his Holy Spirit from that man. Oh, no. It's only those that know what they are and who he is. And it's only by the grace of God that you can stand in front of people. So if, if the devil's wearing you out with that, you, you need to stop it now. And you know when he comes to you. You know when he does. And just say, I'm sorry, I can't go fishing. I don't have a license. And I'm not going to trespass on private property. So you go if you want to. I'm not interested. Amen. There's a time when he says no fishing. I like the way 1 Corinthians 6, 9. I've used this so many times. Uh, listen to this. Listen to this. If you're saved and if you was the kind of rascal I was that deserves to be in hell with the gate locked, this means something to you. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. I've used this with so many people. It says, no, you're not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I know that. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Yeah, I know that, Lord. Nor thieves, nor covetous, 
nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. I know that, Lord. I know that. And such were some of you. <laughs> don't you love that? And you think the Lord don't know us? Sure he does. As despicable as that group just sounded, he says to you through the Holy Spirit, and such were some of you. Yeah, but you have been washed. <laughs> yeah, you've been sanctified. You've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Man, oh man, you want to go fishing, you go fishing with the Lord, okay? Because the devil's only going to take you to the Lord's private pond. And he's going to bring up stuff that you wish you could forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like somebody told me a long time ago, he said, I, you, Preacher, you know where I've been? I said, well, yeah, you know some of where I've been. And he said, I thought about this. He said, you look, he said, I clean up pretty good. I said, fair, not quite as good as me, but you clean up somewhat. And he said, if only they could see all the scars. If only they could see all the scars from the past. And I said, they don't need to see them. They don't need to even hear about them. Yeah, any dead fish can be a prodigal. That's the truth. I've heard the story one time too many. Uh, uh, any, any, any dead fish can be a prodigal. They just roll with the flow of the crowd. But it takes a real man or a real woman to go against the stream and go the opposite direction. I said, they don't need to see those scars. The only one that needs to see them is the one you've already showed them to. Man, I think if memory serves me correctly, announced his call to preach three weeks later. <laughs> yeah. And I said, when you get up and preach and share your testimony, don't air that dirty laundry called people are people. Once they hear something bad about you, they'll never forget it. That's the way people are. Amen. And so sometimes some of your own friends can take you fishing. I want to help you this morning with something the Lord helped me with. Quit trespassing. Stay out of there. Like the sign said, Roger, no fishing, no swimming. Amen. Stay out of that place. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the truth of the precious, blessed, righteous, infallible, inerrant word of the living God. I thank you, Lord, how you moved upon my soul and you brought things back, brought people back to my memory. Only you can do that. And I, I know your word will not return void, but it will prosper that which you please. And I pray, Lord, that you would take this word. I've done all you asked me to do. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would take this word and would put it into the hearts of people. And Lord, if there's anybody here, anybody here this morning that has allowed the devil to beat them down and beat them down to where they don't feel worthy to be ever used of God, I pray you do a work in their heart this morning, Lord. I pray on this very first verse, I pray, blessed Savior, that the Holy Spirit, I can't bring them, wouldn't do any good anyway, but I pray the drawing power of the Holy Ghost brings them to an altar so they can throw up that surrender flag one more time and realizing that they've been trespassing. And then give them a victorious life and give them something to do for you, I pray, my Father. I ask it in Jesus' name for his sweet sake.